This is Olive Avenue in 1928, and this is busy San Fernando Road, looking north in beautiful downtown Burbank, California. We're way out in the suburbs now, where San Fernando Road crosses the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks at Empire Avenue. This industrial center was dominated by the Empire China Company. Allen and Malcolm Lockheed leased 20,000 square feet of working space from the China factory and moved to Burbank from their Hollywood quarters in March of 1928. This is where Burbank hoped the University of California would move its campus from Vermont Avenue in Los Angeles. Westwood got the university, but Lockheed came to Burbank. The first Lockheed airplane built in Burbank was the Vega, named for the star. It was a single-engine aircraft made of molded plywood. Carpenters were the largest group in the original 50-man workforce, and glue was one of the most important materials. Shortly after moving to Burbank, Lockheed received an order for 20 Vegas. This was big business for the young company, worth more than $250,000. By 1929, the workforce had grown to almost 200. Lockheed's wooden airplanes helped make aviation history. Captain Frank Hawks set transcontinental records in his Air Express. So did Colonel Art Goebel in the Vega Yankee Doodle. The Lindbergh set a west-east transcontinental record in their Cirrus. The Vega Winnie Mae was made famous by her pilot Wiley Post. The Altair Lady Southern Cross was flown by the Australian Sir Charles Kingsford Smith. And Amelia Earhart in her Vega was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. In 1930, the airport at Burbank was completed in the wide open spaces near the Lockheed plant. Dedication ceremonies included an awesome display of air power. Formations of twin-engine Keystone bombers flew overhead with their fighter escorts to salute the city's new million-dollar airport. In 1932, the company was bought by the founders of the present Lockheed Aircraft Corporation for $40,000. The new management developed a new airplane, the all-metal twin-engine Electra, which went into airline service in the United States and abroad. The Electra was followed by the Super Electra, a larger model for corporate as well as airline use. A Super Electra set a new speed record in 1939, around the world in three days, 17 hours and 14 minutes. The pilot was Howard Hughes. By 1938, Lockheed had 250,000 square feet of floor space and 2,000 employees. Then, the big turning point. Lockheed was asked to convert the Super Electra into a bomber. The British government ordered 200 Hudsons in June of 1938 and agreed to buy 50 more if Lockheed could deliver all of the airplanes by December of 1939. World War II began while Lockheed was building the Hudsons. Many doubted that so many planes could be produced in such a short time, but the company delivered the 250th Hudson two months before the deadline. The British placed new orders, and production eventually totaled nearly 3,000 by war's end. Lockheed built a new plant for its subsidiary Vega Airplane Company, and in 1940 bought the adjacent airport. In the war emergency, the Army Corps of Engineers helped expand facilities to near their present size. This airport complex still is the site for Lockheed corporate headquarters and a major division, the Lockheed California Company. Then, Lockheed went to war. Factory buildings and the airport were soon under camouflage. All windows were painted or covered for blackouts. These are dummy houses and artificial shrubbery on the factory rooftops. 
A few months after Pearl Harbor, Lockheed rolled out its first B-17. The U.S. Army Air Corps in the summer of 1941 had asked the company to join Boeing and Douglas in building the Boeing designed bomber. Lockheed's first flying fortress was in the air nine months later, one month ahead of the tight schedule. Lockheed started the year 1942 with the largest workforce in the American aircraft industry, 54,000 employees. Less than 14 years earlier, the new plant in Burbank had employed only 50 persons. But employment was to rise to more than 94,000 by 1943. During the war years, nearly 24,000 employees left to serve in the armed forces. To keep production lines moving, thousands of patriotic women went to work. They made up nearly 40% of Lockheed's workforce at its peak, some 35,000 women. Entertainers like Francis Lankford, Frank Sinatra, and Dinah Shore participated in morale building programs at aircraft plants during the war. From Pearl Harbor to the end of World War II, Lockheed built more than 19,000 fighters, bombers, and patrol planes. Nearly one-fourth of the total number of B-17s produced during World War II were built at Lockheed, 2,750 of them. During the 44 months that the United States was at war, the Burbank factories also turned out 5,600 faster and more heavily armed patrol airplanes the Hudson and Ventura. But probably the most famous Lockheed warplane was the P-38. Construction of the prototype began in July 1938, and the first P-38 was delivered to the Air Corps less than six months later. It was the fastest fighter in the sky. No one at Lockheed expected the government to order more than 50 of the twin boom fighter, but production in 18 different versions reached a total of 10,000. Although it never saw combat in World War II, Lockheed's first jet airplane, the F-80 Shooting Star, was first flown in January 1944. That same year, it became America's first jet airplane to go into production. And then it was all over. Lockheed and its employees had made a tremendous contribution to the Allied war effort. But for tens of thousands of employees, peace meant a pink slip. Employment had been steadily decreasing from the 1943 peak, and by 1945, it already was down to 60,000. The war ended in August, and in September, employment dropped to 35,000. But Lockheed had prepared for peace. The company was ahead of the other aircraft manufacturers with a new commercial airliner to offer. The Constellation first flew in 1943. The first 15 of these triple-tailed transports were delivered to the Air Corps. Within a few days after the war's end, eight airlines had ordered more than 100 Connies. And the first was delivered to TWA just three months later. The Constellation introduced a new age of air travel. More comfort for the passenger. Greater speed. Longer range. Lockheed also continued to build military aircraft after the war. The Neptune was a new Navy patrol plane designed for long-range crews. In 1946, the truculent Turtle set a long-distance record Australia to Ohio non-stop more than 11,000 miles. Production of the F-80 jet fighter continued, and 5,000 of a two-place trainer version also were turned out. In the late 1950s, Lockheed went into production on the prop jet Electra, named after the company's first all-metal airplane of the early 30s. The new Electra was fast and economical, and it served airlines around the world but turbojet transports were entering the market, and orders dwindled for the propeller-driven Electra. Even so, 170 of them were sold. Hailed as the missile with the man in it, the F-104 Starfighter was developed in the 1950s for the U.S. Air Force. 
and went on from there in eight different models to become the most widely used fighter ever assembled. Over the next two decades, more than 2,500 of the supersonic aircraft were produced in the United States and six foreign countries. Long held in the public mind as a spy plane is the U-2. The sleek, long-winged reconnaissance craft has served in the forefront of our nation's defenses for over 20 years and remains today unmatched for its purpose and design. A new version, now in production, is designated TR-1. While the U-2's military contributions have been considerable, it also serves the nation as a tool of science. Flying in the colors of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, U-2s sweep the Earth like giant condors, recording weather, mapping, and gathering astronomical and other scientific data to help us better manage the Earth's natural resources. The U-2 was the predecessor of what many believe to be the finest reconnaissance aircraft ever built, the SR-71 Blackbird. Literally faster than a speeding bullet, its twin engines more powerful than the Queen Mary, the ability to cruise at altitudes of more than 15 miles, and sensors which allow it to peer hundreds of miles in any direction have put the SR-71 in a class by itself. Designed by Lockheed engineering genius Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, the Blackbirds hold seven world speed and altitude records. Traveling at speeds in excess of 2,000 miles per hour, or three times the speed of sound, SRs have coursed across states the size of Montana in under 14 minutes. Flown coast to coast in a little over an hour, and crossed the Atlantic in less than two. Perhaps even more remarkable, though, is the fact that today, after almost two decades of reconnaissance service with the United States Air Force, there still isn't another airplane that can touch it, top it, or come even close. As evidenced by the SR-71, part of Lockheed's tradition of excellence has always been to combine superior technology with durability. Probably nowhere are these qualities better exemplified than in the venerable and versatile P-3 Orion. Designed and built to accept constant changes and modifications, today's Orions contain the latest avionics, data processing equipment, and weapon systems to give them unmatched performance and capability. P-3s have been the U.S. Navy's principal land-based anti-submarine warfare aircraft since their fleet introduction in 1962. P-3s are flown in different models by a growing number of nations whose specific mission requirements for maritime patrol, reconnaissance, search and rescue, and a wide assortment of scientific and environmental assignments have been amply accommodated by the Orion family. Complementing the P-3's anti-submarine warfare capabilities is the carrier-based S-3A Viking, which joined the U.S. Navy fleet in 1974. Smaller and more compact than the P-3, the Viking's mission is to protect the Navy's carrier task force from submarines or surface ships. The Viking has speed and endurance and is capable of in-flight refueling for increased range and effectiveness. Like the P-3, the Viking was built with versatility in mind, its basic design suggesting a family of derivatives, such as a cargo passenger transport and an aerial tanker, among others. In one of the boldest steps ever taken by Lockheed, the California company returned to the commercial transport market in the 1970s with a new generation of wide-bodied jetliners, the L-1011 TriStar. From the beginning, the TriStar was designed to be the most sophisticated and technically advanced passenger transport ever built. One that would never be merely on par with the competition, but always ahead of it. Today, after nearly a decade of airline service, the Rolls-Royce-powered TriStar has established new standards 
as not only the most dependable and the quietest of the wide bodies, but one of the most economical to operate as well. A combination that's hard to beat. While it is advanced technology that most characterizes the L-1011, comfort was not overlooked. A wide variety of spacious and relaxed seating arrangements and gourmet galleys for the preparation of superb meals have made the TriStar a four-star favorite with passengers around the world. It began passenger service in 1972 and now flies the routes of many of the world's major airlines. Flying in four different models, with improved performance versions and future derivatives currently in preparation, the L-1011 is set to meet the demanding challenges of the world's airlines well into the 21st century. Paralleling the L-1011's flight into the next century, Lockheed designers are already hard at work on new ideas for tomorrow. On the drawing boards, in computers, and being tested in wind tunnels, transports of the future are developing today. Emerging technologies which only recently appeared as dreams and theoretical design concepts are moving closer to reality. True to its long tradition of excellence, Lockheed is putting shape to the great promise of tomorrow. Still, reaching for the stars.